Well, all right, so whoa. Let me hear a whoa. Out of the way. So a state of awareness only achieved by those dumb enough to find the justice and everything except their own behavior. All right. So we have watched something very significant take place this week. And the reason it's significant is because of what has been going on for the last 50 years. Yeah. Right. That's <clears throat> so ignorance lends itself to manipulation by the forces that mold public opinion. Wow. Yeah. So Will and Ariel Durant, you remember they wrote that 10 volume history of civilization thing, the history of all these different areas. So one of the things that they said, or he said, was sometimes we get manipulated. <clears throat> And our opinions get molded. And that's part of what we have seen in our country for the last 50 years. And uh, so we've seen what I guess you could call the propaganda. Now, John Paul II, not that I'm Catholic, but he did say something interesting. Vast sectors of society are confused about what is right and wrong and are at the mercy of those with the power to create opinion and impose it on <clears throat> well, now we're watching the propaganda machine create opinions and then impose it on others. Now, what has the church done in light of that macro kind of statement? Well, unfortunately, some, in the midst of all the public opinion, people get a little bit intimidated and so they stop saying it. And the church, in a sense, goes silent. And I think. On the one hand, the church over the last 50 years has not been silent, but it has not been extremely coordinated or wise in how it is spoken. So one of the things on my mind, as you know, is that the church and the pastors, the elders, the pastor teachers, whatever the teaching group is, you have them look at that. They need to teach the Bible. They need to construct theology from the Bible, and then they need to speak to the day. And it's taken 50 years to speak to the day, the issue of the day, which is finally going on. So it's a little bit of a problem. So we have a hand up, though. You're going, what the hell are you doing? Oh, here comes Barry. Barry's going to well, Barry, you, you told me earlier you had a plan B. Well, I had a plan B. So, well, you know, I'm going to have a plan B. I got up Friday when the dope came in and I said, oh, we're going to change our topic given the situation of the day. So, what do you call the premeditated termination of 70 million breathing, <laughs> blood flowing, heart pumping, nerve system activated, pain sensitive babies? Wait, say that again? What did you just say? What do you call that? The termination of that. Murder. 70 million. Now, lest we get too far in this, I know. <laughs> At Grace Bible Church, there are some women who have had abortions. So I'm not trying to condemn them. I'm not trying to create any tension. But we do want to speak the truth, but we want to speak in love. So um, just trying to be sensitive for that. What do you call those who assist and receive remuneration for their services to terminate 70 million? What does the church do in light of these facts and figures? And what will God say to people face to face one day when we stand before them? Well, for the church that unfortunately was confused or silenced, I'm not sure it will be real happy. So we have this legal problem that we have, and that is the roadway issue back in 1973. It was that 72 decision making abortion a constitutional right. And uh, you're probably very aware of that. So, Gallup poll back in 2005, and then they did another in 2022. There was a change, right? There was a change. We have more Americans now in favor of choice. Now, the way the questions are worded, that enters into it, absolutely. The way the answers are interpreted, enters into it, absolutely. But at some point, you have to realize that America has changed. We've become more secular. We have not become more spiritual. 
Now, granted, there's the New Age movement and all those other religions, spirituality, you bet. But at the core of America, in terms of how we operate, <clears throat> we're becoming and moving more and more towards a secular society. Part of that's shown in other polls that were just done, showing that less or a smaller percentage of Americans believe in God. Now, again, what God, who's God, all that. Take, take that for what it's worth, but still we're moving in the secular direction, and that's probably somewhat dangerous. I don't know how long of a period of time this was, but they didn't say on the news the other day abortions have gone down somewhat because of sonograms. Yes, it's gone down for 30 years, but it started coming back like it was 2017. Okay, yeah, but no, that's true, it, it was going down. But again, interpreting the data is always a problem. Right, right, right. So, and I, I'm not here to interpret the data, you know, you know, in an unfair way. I'm just saying, seems to be some indicators that are out there. So, this is that decision with Henry Wade. Remember Henry Wade? He's from Dallas. I met him once on a golf course at a Young Life golf tournament. Henry Wade was there, and I remember shaking his hand, and I uh, didn't know, you know who he was really, but uh, I do now. So we have this decision <clears throat> that has been very detrimental to uh, the lives of the unborn. It's caused the church to be a little bit confused and disconnected. Uh, this law had implications after it took place. But think of the number. I mean, if 70 million is correct, and it's probably more, but I mean, that's a lot of people. If those are people we're talking about, you know, take it from there. Now, we also went down the other road. Remember, just this year, um, that should be 2022, not 2022. Uh, both in Maryland and in California, we had people introduce a law at the state center level to you know, say, well, you know, a, a person, a thing can be born, and then you have up to 28 days to decide if you want to take care of it. Mm -hmm. And if you want to set it aside, that's not murder. <laughs> well, that's that's kind of hard to understand, isn't it? but that's that was some of the legislation that had come into place. And part of the reason is this is the kind of mentality. Uh, right? This is that just doesn't represent everybody in the Democratic Party, but it certainly represents some people. Notice I use the D word. Yeah. Because the D word represents what they hold to in this position, right? It's pretty universally <coughs> held to. And they want my tax dollars to pay for this. So uh, this is kind of a problem. Uh, so here are all the people who died in 2020 of different things, but look at abortion. I mean, that's a lot more than all these other things. So according to the WHO, which I'm sure we all trust everything they say these days, but at any rate, 40 to 50 million babies are aborted worldwide. So we're accountable for 10 million, a whole lot more. 50 million. Fred, did you know that the laws in Europe were stricter than our laws before Roe versus Wade got overturned? Even though they did abortions, they could not do like in Austria or Germany, I think you could do an abortion after 13 weeks. It was that yeah. Yeah, So we've we become very liberalized right. and in a sense without even knowing it. You know, we don't we don't seem to take into consideration the global viewpoint of it, but we are radicalized. We have been radical. We always say, well, Europe's worse than us. Well, a lot of things they are, but we've been radicalized on this because of the, shall we say, the left pushing us. <clears throat> page two. The sociological argument. Why 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 do people want abortion? Real simple. Human authority and personal autonomy. Right? That's it. Human authority. I'm God. That's my worldview. That's the foundational reason. And in light of that, then I want total autonomy. My body. Right? We don't, we don't even talk about the appendage. We don't even talk about the tissue. We refer to it as a fetus, maybe, or just something that you deal with from a medicinal standpoint. So the philosophical reason for all this, obviously, is a issue of the world view, right? And that's been the great battle in America. And we've seen a tremendous shift in that. World news are reported because
because they ask ultimate questions and we have to come up with ultimate answers. Is there anything called <coughs> ultimate reality? Is there anything called ultimate truth? Is there any ultimate value to human beings? Can you really know things or not? What is the difference between right and wrong? Is there any? Does it matter? Or is it just a majority vote? What happens at death? Are we just material? Are we just stuff? We go from protoplasm to manure and that's it? That's the end of it? That's true. That has pretty significant implications. <coughs> and what's the meaning of human history? Is it just the this none? Just do your thing and you live and die and next person up and here you go. So worldviews are vitally important because they impact everything at a cultural level. One expression of that would be simply this. Why is one okay and one's not okay? Well, it used to be that the guy kneeling was okay, but now he's not. You know, that's Tim Tebow, in case you missed. Tebow, a very committed believer, his father, very, very committed believer, his mom, a very, very committed believer, especially in the pro life movement. That is also why I think that it's so Yeah. Let me go on. <coughs> Not just this thing, there's going to be a whole lot more going on, unfortunately. So, um, one of the problems is who's your authority? Right? And we're so quick to give it over to some doctor or some politician or some whatever. <laughs> Part of that's our federal republic. Right, we, we give over our rights to elected officials for them to take. You know, well, they're not taking care of us really. And the real question is, who's watching them? Right. In the old days, it was who watches the watchmen themselves. Well, today it's who watches the men in the little white coats. Just because they say so doesn't make it so. So this is dangerous. Now, Francis Crick, maybe someone you remember from your early days in biology 101. He said, no newborn infant should be declared human until it's passed certain tests regarding its genetic endowment. And if it fails this test, it forfeits its right to live. <laughs> Wait a minute. Really? That sounds like the, what um, some of these amendments coming up are that people want to vote on. That, you know, I have 28 days to decide if I buy a divorce <clears> and leave the baby or not. But that's where this comes from. Right? It's a philosophical decision. Maryland and California. Yes. I feel sorry for a starving cat, a fetus that nobody wants. That's not sad. <laughs> uh, starving cat, but a baby, not a boy. <clears throat> Dr. Willard Cates calls abortion the preferred treatment for unwanted pregnancy of the stomach of the second sexually, second sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> An aborted baby is just garbage. <laughs> well, as the old Yiddish Robert, the truth to walk around with any clothes on only lies but the clothed in euphemisms. So we talk about reproductive rights <laughs> and the uh, and we come up with all kinds of names instead of wanting to call it what it really is, and that's a baby. So GK Chesterton top of page three. When we don't believe in God, it's not that we believe in nothing. It's that we can believe in anything. Uh, yeah, that's it. So we're moving away from the Judeo Christian God into believing anything. And we're in danger. So the Nazis went down this road just like we started, right? Liberal theology, errors in the Bible. <clears throat> Church wasn't available to defend anything because it didn't have anything to defend. Naturalism takes over, not theism. Medical society didn't connect morality and science. The doctors didn't get involved. These are smart people, right? Germany, you're brilliant scientists coming out of the tradition of the Reformation, Luther. Church was silent, science was polluted. And the result, well, we got to kill off all these useless eaters, chronically sick, mentally retarded, useless. They don't provide any good. It's called utilitarianism, <laughs> right? Utilitarian mindset, the end justifies the means, what's pragmatically helpful. Not an issue of right and wrong, it's just an issue of you know, what do we think is best culturally. Final solution, six million, which is probably more than that. Six million Jews killed. But 
that's a rebuttal to that, which then justifies the means. The rebuttal is no one knows what the end's going to be. Oh, uh, in general, that's true. And if you're an atheist, ends don't matter. It doesn't matter. To them, I mean, they, they do when you're a real person, but in theory, <coughs> one is as good as the other. Just to add something, in the trial of Robert Wade, they brought in Hegel's Hebrew drawings. <laughs> right afterwards, they were science fiction. Well, they told the jury that uh, you're just killing fish, basically. You're not killing humans, you know. And so that was a lie that was put forward. Yeah, the, the road the way deal was. Uh, I'm now a lawyer. My son is, so that helps. But from what I understand, <laughs> there was no legal argument. There wasn't a constitutional argument. It was a medical argument. Brad, I was just going to say, my father was a doctor, and before he became a believer, he would every so often, rarely, well, every so often, he would have a woman call and say, Dr. Lou, I need to get an abortion. Where do I go? And he said, Well, I don't believe in that, so I'm not, I'm not going to tell you where. And he told me one time, many years ago, he said, When a woman does that, he didn't talk about it spiritually. He talked about it psychologically. He said psychologically, it changes you for the rest of your life. Yeah. And that was from an unbelieving man, yeah. my father. Yeah. It's a human thing. Now, look how you think about it, though, if you're working for the state, the Nazi director of public health, quote, the ill-conceived love of neighbor has to disappear, especially in relation to inferior or the social creatures. It is a supreme <laughs> duty, supreme, of a national state to grant life and livelihood only to the healthy in order to secure the maintenance of a hereditary sound and racially pure whole for all eternity. The life of an individual has meaning only in the life of that ultimate being, that is, in the life of his community, his family, and his national state. So, you know, it's whatever the state deems is done. And we're kind of living in a state run world and they want to run everything. They want to kind of put legislation in for everything we think we're doing. And so uh, some people call it the deep state, whatever they want to call it, it's definitely the movement. So the basic philosophy is man is general. Right? We're just stuck. We're material. And therefore man has no dignity. Remember B.F. Skinner, the great behavioral psychologist. You're basically so there's no difference between a man, a rat, and a radish. They're all material. It's just stuff, chemical, compound, not no dignity. And so we're beyond freedom and dignity because we're just stuff, according to Skinner and others. And of course, therefore, babies are they're disposable if they're unwanted. And euthanasia, well, that also becomes not only tolerable, but it's going to be desirable. And we have that argument taking place in our world today. Whether you live in Oregon or Washington, they try New Mexico, California, some. Uh, and it's becoming more and more. Well, think about it from a historical standpoint, the Old Testament times, back on page four, the Assyrians. Now, these guys were not known for being the nicest of people, but they prescribed death by torture and impalement. That's what they said, the skewers were doing, which on a stake. If a person procured an abortion, there was a penalty back then, way back then. First Enoch, not in the Bible. An evil angel taught women how to smash the embryo in the womb. So that's a viewpoint of what we would call pre-birth death. The New Testament, now think about it. This obviously was an issue during the New Testament times. The Didache, which was a book, the full title is The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. Teaching the Didache, the teaching the 12 apostles. The apostles didn't write it, but you know, if you want to sell books, you put Chuck Swindoll's name on it, and they'll sell more books than put Fred Shea on it, right? So they put a different name on it, open to sell books. But one of the things it said, thou shalt not procure abortion nor commit infanticide. Now, why do you say that unless it's taking place? You don't make laws when you don't have a problem. You make laws when you have a problem. Well, they're they're stating. Things. Why? Because they have a problem. The Epistle of Barnabas, thou shalt not murder a child by abortion, nor kill it when it is born. Mm. 
Well, that's that's abortion issue and infanticide. <clears throat> Tertullian, Christians abominate as murder, both infanticide and abortion, the latter being a kind of murder, murder in advance. And you don't think the church realized it needed to be ethical, it needed to be biblical, theological, and then make ethical statements? This is an ethical statement. And the church in Nazi Germany didn't know what to do, so it did nothing. And the church in America did a lot of things, but it was like a spasm and muscle going all over the place. It wasn't coordinated. And it took 50 years to finally get something to happen. And as much as I am not a Catholic, you can thank part of the Catholic Church over the last 50 years for helping to coordinate the effort as the Protestants were running around. <laughs> Tertullian said, for us, murder is once for all forbidden. So even the child in the womb while yet the mother's blood is being drawn on to form the human being, it is not lawful for us to destroy. This is a, he, he was a lawyer who then became a theologian. To forbid birth is only quicker murder. It makes no difference whether one take away the life once born or destroy it as it comes to birth. He is a man who is to be a man. The fruit is always present in the seed. Can you imagine what were they struggling with? in a barbaric culture, in a throwaway world. They were writing these kinds of things to help clarify what the church should do from an ethical perspective. So by the way, don't, don't ever think that your pastor should not speak about ethical issues. Pastors must speak about the theology of immigration, the theology of climate change, the theology of abortion and genocide. We have to speak about that. Why? Because it's in the Bible. And then the early church spoke about these things as well. So if you ever hear somebody say, oh, no, I, I just teach the Bible. I'm not supposed to talk about that stuff. No. That's, that's in my view, that's not going to do. Well, a number of other quotes that kind of help you see the mindset down there. Number seven, Josephus, the law orders all offspring to be brought up and forbids women either to cause abortion or to make away the fetus. Page five. So, well, what does the Bible say? So, biblical commands, there's no direct command that says, thou shalt not have an abortion. Can't find that there. Indirectly, shall not kill, that might cover it, right? If you assume that the baby is a living being, then you're not supposed to kill, murder living beings, therefore the babies would then fall under that. Leviticus, if a man kills any human life, he'll be put to death. Exodus 12, anyone who strikes a man and kills him shall be put to death. This uh, will Barnabas, you shall love your neighbor more than your own life. You shall not murder a child by abortion, nor shall you kill a newborn. And then, of course, the apocalypse. Peter, now these last two are not Bible, but they certainly seem to indicate something. So, some theological constructs from this. Well, we know children are a gift, according to Psalm 23. Genesis 33, he lifted his eyes and saw a woman and children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. So they're a gift that God graciously gives. God is the one who opens the womb. God is the one who forms the unborn. Jeremiah 1, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Isaiah 49. Listen to the islands, pay attention to people from far. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named me. It seemed to indicate that from God's perspective, Jeremiah and Isaiah were well known to him. He had a plan for them, and he wanted them to come out to do the work. And then, of course, Psalm 139, the uh, famous psalm that we say, When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth, thine eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not. So here's God's providence, here's God's sovereignty, here's God's omniscience, here's God and his comment through the psalmist to help us understand how we might want to view children and the unborn. 
natural. Not granted, Psalms are oftentimes poetic. And sometimes you have poetic language, but this this is somewhat realistic, not just poetic and literary um, freedom of certain things. So the Bible seems to have a very, very interesting view. So the question comes down to personhood, right? When is a person a person? When is a person not a person? Is there a difference in the womb, out of the womb? So this becomes a, a dialogue about personhood, and it involves both science, and we have more and more science coming about, and theology, and philosophy, and metaphysics. So all of this has to go together when we put together our understanding of any ethical issue. And the Bible is the groundwork, it's the foundation, it's the American-inspired scripture, and we build from that theology, and we take in the science, we take in some philosophical thinking and rationality is helpful, and we build our case. But the church failed to do that. We spent too much time maybe screaming and yelling at everybody to build our case. Some did, and that's good. So what is a human? Well, man is from dust with a breath. We know that in the Genesis account, but we also know that man is a divine imager. Now, we usually talk about that. I have the image of God, right? Genesis, I think man was made in the image of God, male and female. He created them. But many people would translate that as not that we have necessarily aspects of our humanity that God shares with us, although I think that's true. But some would say that focus is more on the function and that we are imagers of God. We are here to represent God. Adam and Eve are there to represent God in Eden. And their goal was to turn Eden into the whole earth becoming an Eden. Well, they fail, and we're going to wait, have to wait until Gen uh, Revelation 21 and 22, when what God wanted in, on earth will become heaven and earth together, and we'll have the fulfillment of the Eden situation, but we don't have to wait for that. But in the beginning, there was Adam and Eve, in all their humanity, being imagers of God, divine imagers of God. So we represent Now, on page seven, we're going to skip. When does a fetus receive a soul? So you can skip over to page eight. <laughs> but you can read it when you go home. I didn't want you to be bored on a Sunday afternoon after a road be way. June 24th. We'll never forget that day. So, you know, the question's always been well, okay, let's talk about personhood. When's that start? Is it during infancy? Is it birth, before birth, or viability. I mean, all of these are arguments that people would use trying to figure it out. It seems that the Bible seems to think in the mother's womb and conception might be the only logical place to land it. Viability keeps getting pushed back more and more with our scientific discoveries and abilities. Um, Karl Barth, a very well-known theologian many, many years ago, back in the 1940s, he said the embryo has its own autonomy, its own brain, its own nervous system, its own blood circulation. It is life uh, is affected by that of the mother. It also affects hers. It can have its own illness in which the mother has no part. Conversely, it may be quite healthy even though the mother is seriously ill. It may die while the mother continues to live. It may also continue to live after its mother's death and be eventually saved by a timely operation on her dead body. In short, it is a human being in its own right. There's that word. Right. 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 My rights. You never hear any dialogue about the baby's rights. It's all about my rights. I have the right to my own body. I have autonomy over my own body. I don't have to listen to what anybody else says. And, and this is just like an appendix. You can take it or leave it. Let's leave it because I'm poor, or I'm psychologically I can't handle it, or I just don't want to be burdened. Right. The Bible <clears throat> teaches that none of us have the name rights. We're all subject to our Creator, and we will stand before Him. And a lot of statements say, "I found myself to be pregnant," but they're evading self-responsibility of what. Actions they took to become pregnant. So, 
no one has inviolable rights. No one has free will. God is sovereign, and we're dependent upon Him as free moral agents. So again, as you're working this through your world view, that world view is very different than the world view that we watch in the newspaper and we watch in the government. I just want to ask people sometimes when they start saying, you know, my rights, my rights. I want to say, well, were you a baby one time? Were you in your mother's womb one time? And I think a lot of times we need to ask people questions instead of arguing with them, ask questions when they start saying things like that. When they're saying, you know, talking about the baby's rights. Yeah, trying to personalize it. Right. Instead of this abstraction of an idea, concept, or whatever. Right. So, no, 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 let's, you know, kind of feed us that was a baby. Right. Let's, let's, let's use better terminology. So, personhood, that's what we're trying to struggle with. It seems that inception might be the, uh, the answer. So, but if we accept personhood of the unborn, what about the priority of mother's rights over the child? In, in addition, rights. So, is self defense legitimate? If a, if a mother's life is actually legitimately in danger and you have to make a decision, are you wrong to have a therapeutic abortion to save the life of the mother? Are you guilty of sin? Or are you exempt? From that, because of are saving life. And life. That's a little bit bigger discussion with an ethic. We need an ethical system to determine that. But those are some of the questions. But for us, we live in a pluralistic society. And the question is we have our view of, quote, morality, which we've gotten from Revelation on high. But we live in America that says, no, no, we operate by reason, rationality of our Constitution. So, and in what, what way are we as Christians able to mandate moral behavior? And that's what part of this is all about. You get this. They hate the idea of Yahweh. They hate the idea of Jesus. They hate the idea that they're accountable to him. They want to be autonomous. They want to have total authority. And this is one way. This is only one way. There's all kinds of ways that are going on. This just happens to be in the news today. But it's all part of rebellion. It's all part of Romans 1. I want what I want, and God can't tell me whether it's a homosexual, whether I'm transgender, whether it's my body. That's what all this is. It's open rebellion. And the devil doesn't care. He'll take all forms of it and uses all forms of it. In our country, it's been this lightning rod. And we'll see. So, how do we view the unborn? Are they subhuman? Some people would say so. Are they potentially human? They're not human at conception, but they're human at viability. They're human at halfway out the birth canal. They're human three fourths the way out. I mean, you want to talk about barbarism? Talk about President Obama. He voted twice to have legislation in Illinois for partial birth abortion. He thought that was a good idea. Now, I don't know if he's a Christian, a Muslim, or an atheist, but still, he's smart enough to realize that is ridiculous. And yet, that is what he wanted, that is what he voted for. That is dangerous. Right? That is barbarous. Actually, it was worse than that. What he voted for, it might be. What he voted for was that a child who survived abortion would be tossed in the trash. Mm. Uh, well, that's Francis Crick, right? Yeah. No new warning, but has the right to. They're human unless they pass them down at desk. I guess that one didn't, so he did the crash. What, 1984, they found uh, thousands of fetuses thrown into a trash dumpster in Los Angeles. I mean, this is barbarous, right? Yeah, Pasco. <coughs> So here we have in vitro fertilization, another ethical dilemma that the church has to figure out. So is it wrong to, I'll use the word create, I can't think of it, allow for um, a test tube baby? Is that morally wrong? Some would say yes, but I'm not sure. 
But the danger is the only way this comes about is usually, if not always, by the destruction of tens or hundreds or thousands of other embryos. So if the embryo is a fertilized egg is an embryo and it's alive, a life that's alive and a life, and the system you're using mandates that you destroy a bunch that you're not going to use just to keep the five or ten you want to keep, that's the ethical problem. And, and that's what it's well, we're going to freeze them all. Well, of course, that's not what they do. Maybe some, but not all. So, yeah, we've opened up a big can of worms yeah. with that whole thing. So, here, science is a good thing, but science can be used in a bad way. And that's why we need very intelligent Christian scientists. We need our best going to getting the best education to make impact inside of the walls of all these places to speak the truth, scientific truth. From a biblical perspective, the church has failed to do that as well. Some, but the church has failed to take our best college kids, get them the best training, help them stay faithful, help them stay mature in their walk with the Lord so they can take on positions. I haven't done it. We didn't value it. And I think there was a movie, and I can't think of the name of it. This woman was the head of a um, Planned Parenthood clinic down in, near Bryan, Texas. And, um, she had to go in and take care of a lady one day who was having an abortion and she'd never seen it. She'd never seen it. And then she saw it and she had to leave the room and violently throw up. And she thought, okay, and God has completely changed her heart that day. And I think what happens with Planned Parenthood is they lie about the status of the unborn baby, saying it's just, it's just tissue, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna be okay. You're and, they, be okay. and they You're lie, okay. and they lie to these women. And I really think a lot of these women have been victims of, of the whole Planned Parenthood situation. It's called propaganda. Right. It's like the very beginning. We we hear a message, and it manipulates us into our new opinions. That's what newspapers do. That's what the media does. They're paid to do this because they make big money if they can get you to buy their stuff. No. It seems to me one of the core issues here is discipleship. Because if you take the entire church, what percentage of that population are disciples that are abiding in Christ and actively seeking and walking in Christ? I would say it's a small percentage. And if you're talking about getting the whole church to do something, um, you know, it, if I'm a Christian and I'm going to church, I'm influenced by, and, and I'm not seeking the Lord, I'm influenced by the culture. And I'm more interested in my career, my all these different jobs that I have aside from <coughs> Yahweh, and I'm sure they're not thinking about the same. So this so is why the Great Commission is still the Great Commission. Because if we do it, <coughs> make the disciples, then we are going to evangelize the lost. We're going to edify the saved. They're going to grow up and mature. We're going to help them become theologically astute. They're going to be able to both think, engage, and change culture. And exalt the Savior. And what? Exalt the Savior. Yeah. So that's why the Great Commission is the singular thing that we're supposed to be about. Part of it's evangelism, part of it's uh, educational. We do both of those things together. We can make disciples and disciples. Are able to resist the culture. That, what Jesus' plan was was brilliant. And guess what? He didn't rescind it. We're still in. We're still supposed to be doing that. Right? Whether we're evangelizing or edifying, that's the three. So is it a subhuman? So it's not an if. Is it potentially human? Some would say. By the way, even historically, uh, Dr. Bruce Walking very, very well-known, famous evangelical Old Testament scholar, and Dr. Norm Geisler, a very well-known uh, biblical theologian, both who taught at Dallas Seminary for a number of years, both of them in the past held to there was a potential human mm. idea. They got that out of one verse in the Bible. They both changed their mind with a guy named Jack the Trail ripping the shreds <laughs> in the Arkansas. I read it. And they both changed their view. So good for them. 
But all I have to say is some people find evidence for the subhuman or potential human. But I hope we would go and land on the fully human view. So, but if they are subhuman, then abortion, any kind, issue of life, rights of the mother, right? My, my privacy, my rights, my whatever, don't give my way. If it's potentially human, well, abortion sometimes, depending, and there's a combination of rights. But if you, if you take it that it's, this is a human being, well, then never. That would seem to be the answer. And the mother's rights, uh, yes, but the baby's rights, yes. So what do you do when there's an actual legitimate, you have to do this when the mother dies. That's where your ethical system comes into play. I myself hold what's called a hierarchical ethic. I think that sometimes we are exempt from lower norms to fulfill higher norms. That can be dangerous, but it's like Abraham. Um, you know, the law in his heart, and most people would say you're not supposed to kill your child, right? But God said, go kill your child. And Abraham was committed to go do it. At least he was guilty of attempted murder, if not murder. Uh, so he's guilty of something. But he was obeying not the law, he was obeying the law giver. So he was exempt from the lower. Now, so that's kind of a, a system that you might employ. But the bottom line is, full human, then. These are babies. These are children. These are ones that God knows. These are ones that God is involved with. Barry. This is a question we were discussing last night at dinner with some friends I used to go to church with. And we were talking about how God had provided, you know, given Abraham a promise that he would have a child. And Abraham waited years and years and years. But yet, Sarah went. And took it on her own behalf to arrange for Abraham to have a child by another individual, which ended up creating the chaos that we have now in the Middle East. And again, it's talking about where it comes where it came to is individual struggling, you know, with what's going on in the world right now, what's going on with my finance and everything. And what we were all talking about is waiting on the Lord. Faith and waiting on the Lord. Look how long it took Abraham to have his own child, but then Sarah got involved and created another problem because she didn't wait on the Lord. Yeah. And, and our problem is we, we're Americans, we want things now. My, my rights, I want them now. So, 1969, and that um, person had the act, teleological. Pretty, but she said that the word of our other thing was Richard Garden. Doesn't he show Richard Garden show up right about now? Yeah, in the, in the conversation. Yeah, so in Kierkegaard said we, we go from stages in our ethical decision making. In fact, he uses the Abraham obeyed the law as opposed to uh, the lawgiver instead of the law. And that was an existential experience of moving from one form of maturity to a higher level of maturity. So yeah, Kierkegaard would show up with that because he thought Christianity is not just a bunch of laws. It is an experiential thing where you experience the law giver. You have a personal relationship. Of course, he was living in a very cold state church in Denmark, I think. So he was trying to get away from the state church's coldness and move into a dynamic relationship with God. And so ethically, he comes up with a system which can be applied, I think, uh, in a hierarchical and and. Uh, Christian and non-Christian philosophers use a hierarchical ethic all the time. So, I mean, it's, we're, we're borrowing it from others. Now, placing a higher value on the kingdom seems that it would change many of these decisions because a lot of people will say, what is best for me now, today, in this lifetime? And that's the whole concept. And that may be one answer, at least in their mind. But if they fast forward to the kingdom to come and say, what's going to be best for me when I stand before the Lord, that's oftentimes a totally different. Yeah, we live in the immediacy, right? And we aren't, we aren't able to say, what is the profit of man in the world, but forfeit his soul? 
we, we just want to gain the whole world now. And yet Jesus said, you're going to miss something. Yeah. So are you looking for this world or the world in the future? Then that's a whole issue of eschatology. And what have I always said? Ethics are connected to your eschatology. And the church needs to teach both. Well, all right, real quick. So, again, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor, but I taught this summer. And evidently, the fetus, or etiology, the baby's baby. Right? They, they have everything they need. And water, food, and whatever, and they're going to be a full-grown mature human being because they were a human being. From the beginning, and they have feelings and they have all sorts of things. I guess one of the most startling things to me is and again, I'm not a doctor, but they say that the baby feels pain and they show the baby resisting needles coming to kill it. I mean, does that just make me want to vomit? Yes. And doctors who think that this is okay. Mm -hmm. and, and the euphemisms and the double talk about Planned Parenthood, but the people feel pain, this is all fine. But this is torture. This is murder. This is America. This is the Judeo Christian America where the Judeo Christian influence is thinning out. We're like a cut flower. We've been cut from the ground, cut from the foundation. The flower is still there, but it's withering. That's what's going on. Now, Will Wade reversed it. That's a good thing. Don't you think this is the end of the game? This is going to be just like gas on the, on the fire to the left. Yeah. At any rate, well, so let's, uh, <clears throat> let's move over to page uh, nine. Medical considerations. Well, you know this, so we won't hear about that. Conclusion, page 10. Since God condemns killing of human life and doesn't specify regulations to protect the unborn baby, perhaps he includes the baby in his general command, which gives the fetus as human. And this would make sense because of the other things that we know are true. So go over to page 11. So as you probably know, the church has been all over the map on this. So if you're kind of counting camps, you have fundamentalists, and you have evangelicals. Evangelicals were, well, fundamentalists with the fighting fundies, right? They have um, not enough fun, too much damn, and not much money. But they, they were good people. They are good people who hold tenaciously the Bible. They're skeptical of everybody who doesn't look or smell like them. So they're kind of isolated folks. Okay. But morally good people, good doctrine, oftentimes dispensationalists, which is fine with me. That's a great thing. Um, and then evangelicals were a little more open to science and education and weren't, weren't so rigid about this all and whatever. But these are the kinds of people, along with Pentecostals and Roman Catholics, who were tenacious about the idea of abortion. The mainline church, which by liberal theology resulted in liberal ethical decisions, and they're all over this, right? I mean, they're just, they're just like the world. And even today, you have some evangelicals, some liberals, some Catholics, some whoever, who would allow for abortion under certain conditions. Some would allow it under one condition, some would allow it under three or four. You can decide how you want to work that out. But what we need to remember is Frederick Nietzsche. I like people with the name Frederick. Which is <laughs> yes. But he said, when the world discovers God is dead, there will be universal madness. Mm. Now that's what's going on. <laughs> the worldview has shifted. Less Christians, less religious, different worldview from theism. There is no God. There is no ultimate truth. There is no ultimate reality. If there was, who cares? It's just in your mind. Universal madness. What are the forms of universal madness? Fetal stew. Partial birth abortion and a whole lot of other things coming up later. That's the madness we're looking at. Because remember, the God of this world, it's the God of this world who is blind in the eyes of the unbelief. It is the God of this world who leads this Pelosi 
It is the God of this world who is directing the president and the vice president of this country. I'm not saying they're not Christians. I don't think they are, but I mean, I'm not saying they are or not. What I'm saying is everything they say and do is not what Jesus taught or said. So they're being led by something, someone else. Now, that's a political statement, not a biblical theological statement. Clear. No, I'm, I'm just scratching my head. Thought. The Bible has the monopoly on truth. And, and that is why we as a Bible church study our Bible. That's why we as a Bible church have a doctrinal statement. And that's why we go through it and try to make sure we all understand it. Because we believe that the Bible is the inspired, infallible, and inherent word of God. And we would do well to pay attention to it. What grieves me is that half of our church doesn't go to an old Bible class. <coughs> they don't have to come here. They don't want to get a blue egg, that's no problem. But we need to go somewhere, somehow, to grow. Yeah. 30 minute yeah. sermon is not going to cut it once a week. And listening to somebody, somebody on the internet, that's not going to cut it. There needs to be more. And I appreciate you guys. You show up here and let me rant and ramble. But, but there's a purpose to it. In my mind, this is theological education. That's what Sunday school was for. And that's what adult Bible class is supposed to be. So you get a cold page handout in response. <laughs> Christian response, well, we're supposed to realize this is what it is. It's a spiritual battle. It's a war. We're at war with the forces of evil. Make no mistake. And the Spirit of God indwells us. The Spirit of God leads us. The Spirit of God individually and corporately uses the church. Absolutely. But don't ever mistake the fact that we are in a war. And it's probably not necessarily going to get it. So on the last page, things to think about. Ronald Reagan was quite insightful. Abraham Lincoln recognized that we could not survive as a free land when some men could decide that others were not fit to be free and should therefore be slaves. Likewise, we cannot survive as a free nation when some men decide that others are not fit to live and should be abandoned to worship or in camp. Now that's an intelligent, insightful statement. Not very well received these days. So remember, ideas have consequences, Richard Weaver wrote in his book by the same time. Belief determines behavior. Can who told Environment determines expression. Oh, Marx understood. And God's word is to be definitive. So make no mistake. We're about, that's why you pray for your elders. That's why you pray for your pastoral staff. That's why you pray for your church. And, and we as a part of that. That's why we get up to stay and go into the world. We realize, yep, I'm at war with the world. But here's some encouragement. The New Testament teaches immunization, but not isolation. We're not just to go run and hide in our little Christian commune, right? I mean, how how less fun would it be if you didn't have Bob share stories about where he's off talking to Jose about going to hell? And have the lady say, yeah, get him, Bob. <laughs> and then every once in a while, they say, Bob, you're crazy. Get out of my life. And that's the way it is. That's how the world is. But we aren't supposed to be isolated. We're supposed to be close enough to infect people. <clears throat> New Testament provides a model of being a student of society and scripture. We need to understand the times we live in. We need to understand the culture we're playing in. That's why we read, we think, we interact with one another. New Testament demands us to ask where and when do I break with the culture? When do we say we can't go there or we can't do that? And there will, there will be consequences. You might call it civil disobedience, you can call it what you want, but there will be consequences. And that day is coming to the Church of America. Hopefully we'll be ready. But the New Testament teaches that Christianity is not dependent on environment, but on relationship. Our relationship with the living God and the Spirit, our relationship with one another, right? That's what the church is dependent upon. Culture's always been ugly. Ancient Rome was not a piece of cake to live in. Right? It wasn't a good thing. 
Ours has been the nicest, most wonderful place to live for the last hundred years, you know, and it's all changing. And we better get ready for that. So, Father in heaven, thank you for the decision by the Supreme Court. Thank you that you allowed that to change. Lord, help us be wise and insightful about what we should do in light of this. Help us not gloat. Help us not be the ugly American, but help us be the faithful, loving Christian as we speak the truth in love. So we come and pray this in Christ's name.